this thing on? Because it's getting ready to be on. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bell Ringer. My name is Greg Pokricki. Your guest name today is Nick Williams. He's working with the East Delavan Academy to help people gain the soft skills needed to land jobs in construction, manufacturing, and beyond. He also works with Veridi Parente, one of Buffalo's most promising startups who recently raised a $29 million Series B fund and has helped leading the way in our entrepreneurial ecosystem and advanced manufacturing here in Buffalo and beyond. Awesome episode. Thank you so much for listening. So let's start out. Tell us about the East Delavan Academy for those that don't know. Sure. So East Delavan Academy uh, is an effort that was started by my parents. It's only been around two years, but they've been working on it probably for about 10. So they sort of looked around the community and saw a need for a jobs training program that focused on kind of the soft skills as well as job skills. The reason being, you look around at the stuff people are doing, and Northland Workforce Training Center is great but it requires a 10th grade math and reading level to get in. Giving a person a job is great, but somebody who's never had a job before, they may may fail out of it just because they've never had a job before. Right. East Delavan Academy is aimed at filling in both that educational gap and that soft life skills gap. Some people may have be from a family where nobody's had a job before. They need to learn those basic things that you and I probably learned from our parents growing up how to get up on time, how to be on time to work, how to act professional. These are things that you underestimate how hard it is to learn once you're past a certain age. That's really what East Elevant Academy does. It wraps, it does those wraparound educational services as well as doing jobs training and offering employment at the very end. Right. Yeah, we, so I just, um, I just presented a webinar to uh, UB, current UB seniors and recent graduates, and we had, as my guest was Chris Beckage from Acara, um, a big staffing firm, and he talked about even people that have graduated college, like the soft skills are the biggest thing in, in communication, and no matter what level you're at, that's always the biggest concern for employers, oh, so huge. you know that's so important to teach folks that maybe didn't attain those skills at a younger age well and you've and you've seen people in the professional world all the time who have to get up and make a presentation and are just so nervous because some of their skills are really good but the presentation and the speaking skills still aren't there everybody needs it to a greater or lesser extent it's just that when you go to college and get an accounting degree and then can't present you still have the accounting degree Right. There's a whole segment of the population that didn't get the opportunity to make up for their deficiency in one area with a skill in another area because of systemic issues that weren't their fault, but that they have to deal with. East Elevant Academy is trying to focus on overcoming that. Tell us about some of the jobs and industries that um, the Academy hopes to prepare these folks to enter the workforce into. Sure. So here in our first couple semesters, uh, we've been focusing on what we know. And really what we know is construction. We've been really lucky in the first run to have two great employer sponsors working with us. So Mater Construction and Danforth Construction. Uh, Both companies have essentially guaranteed jobs to our graduates. As you know, obviously I come, East Elevant Academy is founded by John and Heather Williams, who are both, you know, they're both OSC. And OSC has employed a number of graduates from the program as well. But that's just the start. The only rule at East Elevant Academy is that when you graduate, an employer has to offer you a job or we get you into the advanced training that you actually wanted to go to. So it's a success. It's successful for us if we help you get to where you want to go, regardless of what that looks like. Not that we gave you a certificate and we got you out the door. Right now, it's really the construction industry. Next year, there's, you know, there's healthcare companies that are asking us, hey, can we come in and train some of these guys to be able to do some of the entry level stuff that we need? But the entry level stuff in some of these healthcare companies is like $50,000 a year with full benefits. Like these are really good jobs that they can't find people with the skills they need. East Delvin Academy can become their clearinghouse. Right. And it feels like the the perfect time to start to launch something like this. I know you're, you're a couple of years in, but 
Buffalo, like you know, many cities around the country, is experiencing a tightening of the workforce, and specifically in manufacturing or construction, there's you know the wave of retirements on the way, which was the impetus for things like the workforce Northland Workforce Training Center. Um, I know you said so you're you've been operational for a couple of years, but your parents have been working on this for say ten. What was their thought process and in, in developing this initiative and kind of the why behind it all? Well, so it's interesting. When you look at the way Buffalo has sort of, Buffalo bottomed out and started to regrow and you saw a certain economic development, Elmwood Village. Now you're starting to see it in downtown. Now you're starting to see it on Chicago Street. You're starting to see some of these different areas pop up. Yet while you're seeing all this growth, and this is what my parents started to notice, as this Buffalo Renaissance started kicking off almost a decade ago, what they started to notice was that there were significant areas getting left behind. It didn't matter that downtown was getting busier and more popular to hang out in. It didn't matter that Elmwood Village was getting more popular to hang out in. Places like the east side of Buffalo were still suffering. And even Elmwood Village's redevelopment pushed people out. Redevelopment on the west side is kind of doing the same thing. This idea started to kind of grow in their heads because they looked around and saw a segment of Buffalo's population getting left behind and not seeing any reason for them to be left behind. As much as people are saying the workforce in Buffalo is tightening, there's an untapped pool of potential employees that people are leaving behind and writing off for various reasons. I'm not going to accuse anyone of anything in particular, just culturally, Main Street Route 5 is a huge dividing line in the city, and people get nervous about hiring people from the other side of the line. There are hundreds of reasons for that, some of them understandable, some of them not so understandable, but what my parents saw was a need to help overcome those hurdles. So they thought of a couple different ways, they tried a couple different things, and East Delavan Academy kind of grew out of that desire to really say, let's not leave our population behind, let's actually bring everybody up together. Right. How to best equip them for the changes coming. Well, and also to make sure that you don't just hand something out. It's, you know, it's not, these solutions are not as simple as, you know, okay, here's a boatload of cash, go. The cycle of poverty exists because it's psychological, it's systematic, there's a lot of things that go into it. The only way to really break out of that cycle is to start to teach generations of what it means to actually work. It's not fair to a lot of the residents on the east side of Buffalo to say, like, you've never worked a day in your life. They work every single day. They just are forced into industries that are not typical because of the fact that people won't bring them in for legitimate roles. It's a very hard-working population. All East Delavan Academy does is teach them how to use those skills and leverage those skills into different industries and then have the soft skills needed to really start to boost their careers. Right. Now, how do folks that are interested get involved in the East Delavan Academy and then talk a little bit about the curriculum or wraparound services that you do offer once they're in the door? So the number one way for people to get involved in... Uh, East Elven Academy, from a from a student standpoint, is really referrals. Uh, we we partner with Catholic Charities and Seven One Six Ministries um, to do the training right now. Catholic Charities has an office at our East Elven facility, and they provide a lot of wraparound services to make sure that once students are in the program, they have no excuse to leave. There's a food pantry, there's a clothes pantry, they can provide bus passes, they can work on providing temporary childcare, they can actually really help with finding, if they need housing, they can help find housing, they help with crisis services, they help with mental health issues. It's really kind of an all-in-one program. And once you're in the program, you know, even if you can't make it through the first semester, you're not kicked out. If you, so long as you didn't just decide you didn't want to do it anymore, we can keep you in the program and help you get through whatever issues are holding you back. Right. And the curriculum is, like I said before, focused on construction right now, but not just sort of like, here's how you swing a hammer. We 
end of the training with national certifications, OSHA certifications, safety training, job site hazardous training. When you're done in our program, the current employers we work with are ready to hire you out the door because you have everything they need and they've gotten 10 weeks to evaluate you as an employee. So it functions as both training and as an interview for working with these groups. The more employers we bring in, the more options for jobs there are. We, you know, we floated the idea to banks that if they need to learn, you know, they need tellers or they need other kinds of skills where somebody can rise up in their ranks through them, but they got to start here. If they can provide resources on how to train, we can train students to do that. That's what the curriculum is tailored to. It's always tailored to that end goal, which is when you're done, we're not just going to hand you a piece of paper and say, congratulations, have a good one. No, you've got a job. Or if you look around and say, you know, now I want to go to Northland, we're going to get you into Northland. I want to go to ECC. Catholic Charities at the East Elvin facility is an ECC Pathways site. You can go into ECC on an advanced program and you can keep continuing your education there. Our success is defined by what our students want out of the program. Right. We can offer them a lot. All they got to do is show up. Right. And what, what kind of success have you seen? How many students have you placed in jobs and, or, you know, what's that success rate been like over the first few years? So our first class, actually our first class is really interesting and really telling just because of how the semester kind of played out. So our first class, we started off, I think with eight students. Four of those students didn't make it through the program due to issues outside of our control. But what happened to those four students one of them went into mental health counseling through Catholic Charities and so has been part of that program and working through their issues, something they wouldn't have had access to were they part of the program. One of them, unfortunately, went back to jail. Um, sometimes it's hard to get people out of the life. The other two just said, this program is great, but I really need a job now, and so we placed them at Home Depot. But we were able to work with them to make sure that they had success the way they needed it. And the two that are at Home Depot and the uh, young woman who's in mental health care are both welcome back, are all three of them welcome back and can be welcome back into the program. It's up to them if and when they choose to do that. The other four graduated and got jobs. Right. This last semester we had 12, same thing. 12 graduated, got jobs. We've actually, we're employing two of them at uh, OSC right now. That's great. And then how do you... At what rate do you hope to grow the program over the next few semesters? You know, it seems somewhat intimate. At 12, what do you think you can scale it to? So the goal is to scale it. You're probably not going to get, at our current setup, much more than 30 students per class. Um, and the reason for that is because you're dealing with such a high-risk population Excuse me. You want to make sure that you're focusing on every student as much as possible. Every student needs some kind of attention or some kind of focus. We're not trying to churn out numbers. Um, we have enough referrals to probably fill 15 classes. Um, and the referral list actually becomes really a client list of Catholic Charities. Obviously, Catholic Charities provides free services, but that list of referrals into the program, you know, they can't come into the program right now. Oh, but you know, what do you guys actually need right now? We still provide services. It just may not be East Elevant Academy, right? right? And that's and that's really, you know, we want to grow this steady, and we want to make sure that we're not overgrowing ourselves. Right. So this is um, just a small part of what you do in our community. Um, you also work with Verdi Parenti, which is a growing startup. Tell us a bit about that as we kind of transition our conversation into um, your more day-to-day -day role. <laughs> sure. Uh, so this is actually a really timely week to talk about Veridi Parente because in two days I'm leaving to go to Las Vegas for something called Con Expo where our construction equipment is going to be debuting to the entire world. Now, I can't tell you who we're working with, but I can tell you that Green Machine, which is a sub-company under Veridi Parente is working with about three or four of the largest construction equipment manufacturers in the world in deploying 
battery powered equipment. So to back up a little bit, because I got I jumped the gun slightly, but just, I'm, I'm just really excited. I can't help it. I'm excited yeah. for you. That's big news. <laughs> so so Veridi Parente is a, a startup in Buffalo focused on changing the way we deploy energy, you know, the way we deploy energy. I'm trying to think of a more clever way to say that, but that's pretty much it. Anything that uses diesel fuel right now is up for conversion with one of our battery packs through our green machine company. And any building, residential up to heavy industrial, is a viable option for our storage product, which is under our Volta Energy company. The core technology is a battery pack. But in reality, what it is, is a way to change how we use energy. Fossil fuels are incredibly energy dense, but the way we access the energy inside them is incredibly energy inefficient. So a typical diesel engine is probably about 15 to 20% efficient. So if I've got 100 units of energy in the fuel tank, once it goes through the diesel engine, I only get out about 10 or 15, which is brutally inefficient, but that's considered to be the best we have right now. Veridi Parente disagrees. Our technology is designed essentially to make sure that how we use energy is always one-to-one. That's the purpose behind battery packs and construction equipment. That's the purpose behind the battery packs and storage. On the storage side of the house, everybody's talking about how the grid is in so much trouble, it's old, the infrastructure has to be upgraded, and we're worried about fossil fuels in generation plants. Our battery packs allow you to level levelize the grid preserve infrastructure, and get rid of those coal-fired peaker plants that are necessary right now to power the grid. The best way I can talk about what we're doing is that we're taking a look at the way we use energy and saying we can do better. And Verity Parente raised, I think it was a $29 million Series B fund. Um, And one of the, you know, faster growing startups locally. Talk just a bit more generally about starting a business in Buffalo and the workforce, finding venture capital, and this entrepreneurial ecosystem that's growing and kind of all all the machinations of that as you grow to the point where you're at now. Right. So venture capital is a funny thing, right? (laughs) It's when you're starting off, it's hard to find. Once you get rolling, it's hard not to find it. <laughs> but so like venture capital is like anything else, right? People when they people are more comfortable investing in something when they see other people investing in it. So the key in starting a business, especially in a small community like Buffalo, is knowing who your friends are and who to ask at the right time. Little known story about Green Machine. Green Machine successfully So when I say Green Machine, I'm referring to Veridi Parente and Volta. We kind of all it's the three companies are really the same entity. But Green Machine was the first entity, and it existed inside of OSC as kind of an R&D center. It might have been seven years ago now. We tried to spin Green Machine out in a funding round, and we didn't make it. We didn't make the number we were looking for, so we didn't spin it out. It, was, it wasn't until 2018, when we had gained a little bit more market traction, that we were able to take that swing again. So what I'd say about starting a business anywhere, but especially in Buffalo, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Because the only way you know you're not going to succeed is if you don't do it. Right. But that's, I mean, the nice thing about being in Buffalo, uh, especially right now, is because is that because there's been so much attention on the city and actually because the city cratered and then started to regrow it's a community that really works together from politicians to business people to you know activists in the community it's a really great ecosystem to start a business if you put down roots here and you show that you're part of the neighborhood the neighborhood will embrace you and will help you grow that's it's just it's rare to see that New York City you put roots down and people are going to try and cut your legs out from under you Boston <laughs> it's the same thing LA forget about it 
Buffalo, so long as you put in the work to be a good neighbor, the city's yours. Right. And the work that your company is in um, is also an interesting kind of mesh point for Buffalo um, as this, you know, it has this rich manufacturing history and, and now we've transformed a lot and diversified our economy, but also diversified the manufacturing industry to be a lot more advanced and green. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, how, how do you think our city, our region can lead the way both in that startup ecosystem, but also in advanced manufacturing, clean energy? Well, the first thing to always remember is that you never want to be manufacturing what people want in this exact moment. You always want to be looking ahead because right now advanced manufacturing is changing so quick. Uh, it's hard. If I had, if I was starting a manufacturing plant today, and I, you know, was doing a ribbon cutting today, and then was going to build it out, the product I would build would either change six times before the manufacturing line ever got built, or I'm going to go out of business in two years. You, you know, we can. There's, there's a lot of good examples of that around, but then you also see some good examples of, of some really forward-thinking companies. To Tesla's credit, down in uh, the Solar City neighborhood, you can see the wheels turning as they're changing direction a little bit, but the reason they're doing that is because of the changing market. Their first idea wasn't working because they over they misread the market and thought they had something, and turns out they didn't. It's fine to admit you have made a mistake. The way Buffalo can really take a leadership role in this kind of stuff is to work with the state to ensure that these old manufacturing sites that are perfect for advanced manufacturing don't get forgotten about just because one person fails. So let's you know take a lot of Bethlehem Steel has been released now, but let's take that as an example. If somebody comes in and wants to buy the site and for whatever reason becomes unable to do it, our tendency in smaller cities like this is to just go, you know, oh, we lost and now that site's just going to be industrial blight. No, market the hell out of it. The site had value to that person. It'll still have value to somebody else. Buffalo has such a widespread of sites that are so perfect for manufacturing. You know, the fact that we don't have every manufacturer beating down our doors trying to get a spot here is just because we're not doing a good enough job marketing. We need to get that word out that Buffalo really is the site to come. Again, like you talked about, there's workforce. We have a workforce here that's ready to jump in. Like I just said, it's a great ecosystem to have a business. And all these sites that are perfect, really shovel-ready to go. So the city really needs to focus on marketing these sites and then working with all the officials necessary to get those sites back into use. Working with the utility companies, working with the cable companies, working with the state if there's you know brownfield issues that need to get resolved. But everybody can work together. And again, that's what I love about Buffalo, is that I'm saying all this stuff like I'm teaching somebody something new. And I'm not. I'm just saying what the city's already doing. It's a great time to be in Buffalo and, you know, to be, not to not to throw a hashtag in here, but to be hashtag building Buffalo. <laughs> That's, <laughs> right. And uh, they're going to be happy from the last event that I actually threw that hashtag in there. Yeah, I'm going to... I'm texting the PMP folks right after this. No, that's a perfect tie-in, though. Um, we're actually at Invest Buffalo Niagara, and some folks that listen to the podcast... I'm sure I already know, are undergoing a Western New York industrial real estate um, strategy, engaging national consultants. And just a few weeks ago, we had those consultants in town and did ton they did tons of one-on-one -on -one interviews and round tables with utilities and, right. you know, lawyers, politicians, um, developers, obviously. So there is that collaborative feel and we see that every day in our office and in our work. So well, it's good work that you guys are doing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's let's zoom out a little bit. Talk about that vision event. It's kind of where I want to end and land the plane here. Um, you spoke on a panel at this event. It was all about each of our collective visions for the future of Buffalo entering this new decade. Uh, where do you see Buffalo in 2030, 10 years from now? Oh God, 2030 is 10 years from now. <laughs> You could pick a different year if you'd no, like. <laughs> no, let's let's just let's just go with it. 
20, so in 2030, I see Buffalo striking a really good balance in terms of manufacturing and what you might call desk jobs. So desk jobs, I'm, I'm counting lawyers, accounting, uh, tech jobs, stuff like that. Professional Pro- services. Exactly. There's, oh, yeah. You guys would actually know the term for that. <laughs> <laughs> Professional services versus manufacturing jobs. You need a balance of both. Right. And I think by the time 2030 rolls around, you'll see, I would say, 70% of the sites, industrial sites in Buffalo, put back into use for manufacturing purposes. Um, which is, you need manufacturing jobs because those typically lead to the kinds of generational wealth that lead to the people in the professional services industry. But I think in 2030, you're going to see an east side of Buffalo that isn't gentrified, but it's lifted up. Same thing with the west side. You're going to see the west side avoid gentrification and really be lifted up by these manufacturing jobs. And you're still going to see the same kind of growth and strength of Elmwood, downtown, everything else. You're going to get a much better balance across the city. And that's that's what I see, but that's also sort of my wish, is that that's what we're going to end up at. Right. You won't have these pockets of just poverty. And you're working to make it happen. Yes. <laughs> we're, certainly, we're certainly trying. Uh, my vision for Buffalo in 2030 is that the Bills are going to have won three Super Bowls by then. What's your take on that? My take on the Buffalo Bills winning three Super Bowls by 2030? I am a huge football nut. <laughs> this You just opened a door that could last for three hours. I will condense it. Okay. I will say I will say at least one Super Bowl. Three is optimistic. Three, is, like. <laughs> three I mean, you're, you're talking dynasty right then. Yeah, but that might be too many. But in 2030, Sean McDermott will still be the coach. Brandon Definitely. Bean will still be the general manager, and the Buffalo Bills will be kings of the AFC East. And Josh Allen will still be the quarterback. He'll be slinging them like nothing <laughs> else. I like it. Um, thank you so much for your time. Before we let you go, we have a few Blizzard round questions. That ties in nicely. Uh, there is going to be a sports question, but we'll start. If you were a flavor of ice cream, what would you be? I would be... Uh, I would be the Snickers ice cream that I had uh, on Thanksgiving because when I ate the Snickers ice cream, the Bills won against the Cowboys. So I am, I am a fan of Snickers ice cream until it betrays me. That was probably my favorite game of the Bills season. Oh, that's great. Book or TV show that you'd recommend? I would highly recommend the TV show Psych. Uh, that's on, uh, if you have Amazon, it's on that, but it's a USA Net- Network original show. Starring uh, James Roday and Dulé Hill. If, for those of you who are West Wing fans, Dulé Hill was Charlie in the West Wing. Right. And now he, in this one, he's kind of like a buddy cop thing. It's hysterical. Text or phone call? Oh, it depends. Um, I go with a text because then they can ignore it if they want. Okay. What do you like to receive, though? I like to receive from family. I like to receive a phone call. From business people, I like to receive a text. Bills or Sabres? Oh, come on. Don't make me choose that. <laughs> I, I, I will go with the Bills only because I played football, so I understand it more. But I, I got love for all the Sabres. Hiking or skiing? Skiing. Last question. We were talking about this before the episode. Chicken wings, drumstick or flat? Drumstick. I agree. Every time. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today. really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank you. privately funded, nonprofit marketing and economic development organization. Please rate this podcast, follow our social media channels, and read our blog at buffaloniagara.org for the best of Buffalo Niagara. Come grow your business with us.